the panel, the discussion, an objective and impartial view of the issues of interest to you. Nation Beat is on now. Hi, good morning. I'm Nkrumah Lucien and this is Nation Beat. Today we'll be having a discussion with retired senior lecturer and chairman of the Reparations Committee of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Claudius Fergus. Dr. Fergus is also the author of two books, one of which we will be focusing on today, which is called Against Toleration. This book focuses on the prohibition of spiritual Baptists or black Christians in, the, in various parts of the Caribbean. Uh, we'll also be looking at the issue of reparations, emancipation, and related topics. So, Dr. Fergus, we can start off by discussing a little bit. You could tell us a little bit about yourself as a lecturer and an academic. Uh, academic. First of all, thank you very much, Nkuma, for inviting me to this program this morning. I worked at the University of the West Indies for several years, where I ended up as the head of the Department of History in the position of senior lecturer. I have written a number of articles published in uh, scholarly journals in North America, Britain, uh, West Africa, the Caribbean. I've also published a number of book chapters, the latest being last month in a huge volume on Caribbean criminology, uh, edited by Professor Wendell Wallace. And uh, this year, well, first of all, my first book was published in 2013. Uh, it's called Revolutionary Emancipation, uh, Abolitionism and Emancipation in the British Caribbean. And then uh, this year, just in March this year, my latest book was released and launched in Trinidad. And it is called Against Toleration, Britain's Pub Prohibition, Persecution, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Britain's Persecution of the spiritual Baptist. Yeah, and I need to correct what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. It is not black Baptist, it is only the spiritual Baptist. While oh, it covers sense. black Christianity, particularly black Baptist church, but the, the organization, the, the, the group that was prohibited by law mm -hmm. was only the spiritual Baptist. Okay, so the spiritual Baptists, we know of them in Trinidad. They were um, fictionalized in the book by Earl Lovelace, one of astonishment. Um, but in St. Lucia, we don't have a, um, a long experience of it. So if you could tell us a little bit about that tradition and other similar traditions within the Caribbean. Right, well, Earl Lovelace's book is not just fictionalized. I, you're correct in the term. Mm -hmm but it is really the, the, the true story of the spiritual Baptist. Mm -hmm. I believe Earl himself is a spiritual Baptist. Mm -hmm. He's a practitioner. So the wine of astonishment is about putting that life into the experience of the spiritual Baptist and the liberty that a novelist can have that historians cannot you know, engage mm -hmm. in. So it's an excellent book. It, 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 it tells about the actual struggles of the spiritual Baptist, the practices of the spiritual Baptist. Now, the spirit, I'm, I'm not a member of the faith. I think I yes. need to make that clear. Mm. Uh, so there are certain things about doctrine, theology of the church I look at only from a historical perspective, mm -hmm. not from a doctrinal perspective. Okay. The spiritual Baptist belong to the African Caribbean Baptist Church. The church came out of North America during the, the era of the War of American Independence. Independence. Mm -hmm. A number of Africans left the United States at that time, 1780s, mm -hmm. and went to Canada, some went to the Bahamas, and some went to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. They, most of them belong to the Baptist Church in South Carolina and Virginia, mm -hmm. which in fact had been founded just about 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. So they took the church into that new diaspora that they created in Canada, and particularly Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. in Bahamas, and in Jamaica. And uh, in Jamaica, they face persecution. I have not seen attempts at persecution in the Bahamas. 
Now, those three areas are important because the branch from Nova Scotia mm -hmm. also went to Sierra Leone mm -hmm. in 1792 and established the first Baptist church in Sierra Leone. From Sierra Leone, a number of the descendants of that group migrated through the, liber the, the African indentureship program that the British had instituted from the 1840s. Some of them came to Trinidad. Mm. So the Baptist Church had this circular movement in the Caribbean. In Trinidad, you also have the founding of the first Baptist Church coming out of the war of 1812-1814, uh, which America fought against England mm -hmm. and uh, a num again a number of Africans who were enslaved were enticed to run away to join the British Army they did so and uh, after the war they were taken to the to Bermuda mm -hmm. where it was expected that they would remain in uh, the military but they had been given two options one to remain in the army to, to be resettled in a British colony. Mm -hmm. They decided to choose the second option. So they re relocated them to Trinidad in six companies. The place where they were relocated, even today, they are called the company villages mm -hmm. around Princess Tong and Moruga. So they brought the first African Baptist Church to Trinidad. Some of the the practices are similar. The baptism, for example, now generally Baptists engage in what is called credo baptism, mm -hmm. adult baptism. Mm -hmm. But the Black Baptist Church engage in what is called baptism in living water. Mm -hmm. In other words, the water has to be moving, not just a pool, mm -hmm. but the sea mm -hmm. or a river. So that is a fundamental practice among Black Baptists whether it is in North America, in the Caribbean, in Sierra Leone. Now, the spiritual Baptists were different. Mm -hmm. They practiced all those things, but they also practiced a new rite, which is called mourning. Mm -hmm. Mourning is what distinguishes the spiritual Baptist from the other Baptist churches. Mm -hmm. And it is only the spiritual Baptists, we know that because it was only those who practiced mourning were prohibited from practicing their religion. Mm -hmm. They did not attempt to prohibit the American church, which is the name that we call the people who came to Trinidad from North America mm -hmm. via the company villages. They did not attempt to prohibit their church. Mm -hmm. And they were Baptists. Mm -hmm. There were other black churches in, in Trinidad at the time the AME Church, for example, was established, that is the African so Methodist, Methodist Episcopal, Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. the black church, mm -hmm. and they were established in the 1780s in Trinidad. No attempt was made to prohibit them. Okay, so given that, what, what would you say? Well, I think you covered that in your book. What led to the desire to prohibit that faith? One, it was the challenge that the so-called established churches faced. Mm -hmm. Mainly, the Anglican Church, and, and secondarily, the Methodist Church, particularly in St. Vincent. Yeah. You said established churches? Well, they were established during the slavery period, okay. but most of them were disestablished uh, in the okay. 19th century. Okay, I don't want to take you off course. Eh? So I say yeah. established, right. because okay. they were in fact the church of the elite still, yeah. the yes. ruling class. Yeah. I want you to explain the term though. Establish yeah. in terms of how you use it, but um, yeah, but you were explaining okay, why Okay, so we they can come back everything. to that. Yes. But in terms of why they targeted this particular denomination. Mm -hmm. One, the threat to undermine the, the established quote-unquote mm -hmm. churches through their rapid growth. Mm -hmm. In other words, the loss of membership of these churches was, was, was threatened by the rapid rise and popularity Mm -hmm. of the spiritual Baptists. Masses of people flocked to their meetings and so on. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that they were very scared about. And it was one of the things that they, 
is behind why they left the American church intact. Because the American church was not engaged in what we call proselytism, you know, conscious attempts to spread the religion. Mm -hmm. The religion is mostly isolated among the company villages. Okay. But the spiritual Baptists used to go on mission, mm -hmm. preaching. They would right. say that they got a vision. Mm -hmm. That vision would compel them to go on mission, preaching, sometimes all over the country. Right. They call some of them, you know, the candlelight mm -hmm. and wayside Baptists and so on. My mother's sister, first sister, was one mm -hmm. of those. That's the time when I saw her, when she was on mission. Mm -hmm. You know, so they would go. And that, the power of their preaching, and in addition to that, they were well known as healers, mm -hmm. faith healers. They were the first faith healers of, of modern times. Mm -hmm. You know, things that are so popular now among evangelist churches. Yeah. But that they were condemned for too, mm -hmm. right? But the main thing was the popularity, the growing popularity. The second thing was that they represented a financial threat and uh, by extension, a threat of being overly independent in a society in which African people were, were expected to be subservient and subordinate mm -hmm. and, uh, and dependent upon uh, white charity, the white economy, white financial institutions, mm -hmm. and so on. Through the friendly societies, the Baptist control of most of the independent, quote unquote, independent, because friendly societies were introduced just on the eve of emancipation. Mm -hmm. But they proliferated after emancipation and they were controlled by the churches mm -hmm. Methodist Church, Roman Catholic Church, Anglican Church. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was a sudden spurt of independent, friendly societies. Mm -hmm. Many people can relate to that friendly societies. But the Baptists were at the forefront of the, of the management and, and the running of these independent mm -hmm. friendly societies. And because of that, they represented a significant threat to the establishment. Permit me to read one quote from no mm -hmm. a gentleman here. This is on page 95 of the book. And the, it, it's coming from a gentleman who went to the West India Royal Commission, which was a commission in 1897, mm -hmm. investigating the state of the economy. So he thought, for example, he recommended to the commission that the laborer, this is his words, mm -hmm. the laborer by his lay, friendly, and religious societies and his revolt from the healthy control of the clergy of the church, mm -hmm. church meaning Anglican church, mm -hmm. and ministers of Wesleyan body, now this mm -hmm. is about the St. Vincent situation, mm -hmm. shows he is testing the pleasure of thinking and determining for himself. Mm -hmm. You see how that mm. independent thought is a threat yeah. to way, the mm. ruling class, the colonial ruling class. Mm. And he recommended that the government take action. Mm. Now that's 1897. Mm. In 1903, the first bill was brought to prohibit the spiritual Baptist mm. in St. Vincent. And they would have brought it in 1902 if not for the volcano. All right, good. Now, yes, yeah, so one of the arguments you raise in this book is the in in effecting the prohibition uh you spoke about the toleration act um its effect in the caribbean and also um how it stood in relation to legal practice in england itself so if you could just elaborate on this for me the okay. dilemma of the toleration act itself right in general, the history of Europe is a history of religious intolerance. Mm -hmm. the, the guiding principle was the religion of the ruler, meaning the king mm -hmm. or queen in some instances, yeah. was the ruler of the subjects. Mm -hmm. So people had no choice. They had to practice the religion of the monarch. Mm -hmm. However, in 1688, the British underwent what is called the Glorious Revolution, in mm -hmm. which the middle class, a strata of the middle class, 
succeeded in raising the status of Parliament mm -hmm. above that of the control of the king. Mm -hmm. And they brought in a piece of legislation almost immediately. One of the first pieces of legislation was the Toleration Act, mm -hmm. which compelled the king to recognize the right of conscience to what they call nonconformist mm -hmm. groups. At the time, the Baptists, the Wesleyans were not there, the Methodists, but the mm -hmm. Baptist Church, the Quakers were also mentioned, mm -hmm. right? So the Baptist Church had been mentioned actually in the very first act. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church was not included. In fact, the law specifically stated that popism, as they call it, Roman mm -hmm. Catholic religion, was prohibited in all its intent and purposes mm -hmm. in all spheres of life. Mm -hmm. And that meant in terms of being able to uh, be representatives on town councils and so on, in terms of uh, rep uh, entry into universities and so on. No Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. none whatsoever. So that's the beginning of the Toleration Act. Over the centuries, you had amendments broadening the rights to different groups and expanding the rights. For example, you have what is called the Test Acts, the Test and Cooperation Acts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and those acts, those acts allow nonconformist representation on councils and so on. Mm -hmm. But the, in, 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 in 1855, you had two fundamental laws that expanded the right of conscience to all groups that acknowledge a deity. Okay, did it have to be Christian or? Whatever one they, a deity? They, they, they specifically said, mm -hmm. and all other groups, mm -hmm. because they mentioned a number of denominations, mm -hmm. and all other groups that recognize a deity. Okay. And that, after that law, it meant virtually you could not prohibit under the British Constitution, but because the Toleration Act was an act of the British Constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, you could not prohibit a religion for whatever reason. You could mm -hmm. prohibit certain practices. Okay. Okay. You know, America has that in the First Amendment, mm -hmm. the right of conscience. Okay. But you can prohibit something that, that some of the church people are doing. Mm -hmm. But you cannot prohibit the religion okay. All right. itself. Yeah, we we'll do know? for a break. Um, when we yes. get back, when we come back, we would like to continue that discussion on the Toleration Act and also how the law was actually put into practice within the Caribbean. And St. Lucia, I guess, would fit into this in some exactly. respect. Yes. So we'll be right back. This is Nation Beat. Hello, ECS. Yo, OECS, this is your ocean. If I am to protect your future, we have to work together. It's the time to work together. If I am to help protect your future. Once I used to be so pure and clean. And those hills were so fresh and green. But now you see me as your dumping ground. The current situations. OECS, green actions, blue oceans. Welcome back to Nation Beat, and we are continuing our discussion with Dr. Fulgas here, talking about his book, Against Toleration. So we were speaking about, before the break, about the law that had been passed in Britain to allow for um, the practice of various religious traditions. Um, in your book, you deal with the spiritual Baptists and how they were dealt with in the Caribbean. So I'd like you to go into the mechanics of how that law was brought into place and um, something that um, became apparent too is that 
within the Windwell Islands, which, of which St. Lucia is a part, um, we used to be governed together. If you could just tell us a little bit about that and then go into how that law was actually brought into effect. Right. The first colony, because that was mm -hmm. the status at the time, mm -hmm. 19, early 1900s, mm -hmm. the colony <coughs> of St. Vincent was part of the Windward Islands, mm -hmm. which was under a governor general, sometimes simply called governor, because mm -hmm. there was just one governor. Yeah. The other colonies were governed directly by administrators. So mm -hmm. you have the administrator in St. Vincent who really was an assistant governor. Mm -hmm. And in St. Lucia, sometimes they were called administrator, but sometimes commissioner. Mm -hmm. But in terms of rank, the governor was based in Grenada. Mm -hmm. That was the seat. The Church of England was based in St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. St. Lucia, however, was second in rank to Grenada. Mm -hmm. So the commissioner was higher in rank than the administrator. Okay. So that if the governor was out of office, particularly on vacation, the commissioner, mm -hmm. that is the administrator of St. Lucia, mm -hmm. would be the acting governor for the duration of time. Okay. Or if he transitioned, you know, yeah. the, between that time and the time that he was replaced, the, the administrator or commissioner mm -hmm. of St. Lucia would govern. Now, St. Lucia commissioner was critical to the prohibition of the spiritual Baptist. Okay, tell me, yeah. Because, as I said, this I call it in short, you know, PWRA, mm -hmm. the Places of Worship Registration Act 1855. But even before that, governors were told, as a result of the prohibition in Jamaica and St. Vincent in, 19, in 1808, they were told specifically by the colonial office. The colonial office is the arm of the British government that governed the colonies mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. They were told specifically by memorandum that any law that impinges on the right of, of conscience must first be sent to England for review mm -hmm. and before it is passed in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So it should not even be presented to the legislature. In 1903, the new administrator in St. Vincent, whose name was Edward, Cameron, uh, Edward um, Cameron, mm -hmm. you know, I believe he's a, a relative of David Cameron mm -hmm. who became um, British Prime, Prime Minister. Minister. Mm -hmm. right. So Edward, um, Edward Cameron was the administrator and he brought, he had a previous experience in the Caribbean mm -hmm. of, of um, administration, colonial administration. So he was posted to St. Vincent as administrator. Mm -hmm. He brought the first prohibition bill mm -hmm. in 1903. It was submitted to review, because he knew the law. Mm -hmm. It was submitted to review, and uh, the attorney general, who was based in Grenada by the name of Tarin, mm -hmm. C.J. Tarin, mm -hmm. he said such a law will not be able to get the assent of the colonial office and advise the governor to veto it, mm -hmm. which the governor did. In 1905, between 1905 and 1906, most of the, I call them the guardians of conscience mm -hmm. for the, on behalf of the colonial office, most of them either resigned, were posted somewhere else, and so on. And that opened a window for Cameron to bring back another bill, almost the same thing. Mm. And uh, he sent it, 1908 bill, prohibition. Mm. Again, he sent it to England. He did not present it to the legislature. He sent it to England mm. for review. The reviewers in the colonial office vetoed the legislation, mm. said they cannot allow such an, a law to such a bill to become law. Mm. Now, previous to that, Jamaica had attempted a similar bill in 1903. Mm. It was vetoed on the island itself. It didn't go further than that. The governor vetoed it mm. there, right there. 
So there were attempts to, that one was against Pocominia and mm. Revival Zion. So that was the end of that. But in 1909, a new administrator arrived in St. Vincent, Murray, Gideon mm -hmm. Murray. Mm -hmm. Now, he was at the colonial office when Cameron's bill was being reviewed. He knew about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, at one time, it seemed as if prohibition was part of the mission that they sent him to St. Vincent to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, in 1912, when the governor went on office, James Sadler went mm. on vacation between June to return in October, mm. in July, Murray brought this prohibition bill. The acting governor was the same man who wanted to prohibit the spiritual baptist, Edward um, Carrington. Mm. Cameron. <laughs> mm. Cameron, yes, who had been posted from St. Vincent to St. Lucia as mm. the commissioner. He was now the acting governor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and, and Murray agreed to present the bill to the legislature directly, mm. which was the first violation, not of the Toleration Act, but violation of the memorandum that the colonial office had sent. Mm -hmm. The bill was passed, sent to um, Caridon, Edward, mm -hmm. endorsed or sanctioned, and the, the administrator of St. Vincent was allowed to implement the law immediately. So mm. they proclaimed, you know, gazetted the law, mm. implemented, and uh, a few days later, the law was on its way to England. Mm. So by the time the law reached England for review, they had already implemented the law. The colonial office, therefore, was in a bind. They decided to thoroughly review the act, so we have all the notes and so on of that review. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is in the book there. But most of the people who reviewed the legislation either worked under the administrator when he was the permanent secretary, mm -hmm. the assistant secretary to the permanent undersecretary, which is like a PS in our mm -hmm. system. A man that most of the main actors who reviewed the legislation and mm -hmm. recommended prohibition had been in South Africa with Gideon Murray during the Boer War between 1898 and 1902. Mm. They were his boys, his mm. subordinates. And he had some very powerful connections in government and parliament. Mm. His senior brother was a member of the upper house of lords. Mm. His junior brother was a member of, of parliament as well. They were well connected. So. Even some of the people who worked with him in, the, in South Africa, mm. they were also in very powerful position in the government. In other words, I see it as a conspiracy. Okay, yeah. So everybody here was well placed to... Well positioned. That law could not have been passed if mm -hmm. Murray had not been the administrator, if Cameron had not been the acting governor, mm -hmm. the law would not have been passed. So we need to look at the politics behind the prohibition, not just the fact that this is a racist piece of legislation and so on. Yeah. Racism does not explain why the law managed Mm. to get the assent of the colonial office. Mm. It's part of it, but it's not the reason for it. Mm. It's, the, it's the, the, these circumstances that somehow came together mm. to, to, to facilitate the passage of the law. Okay, so, um, okay, so it was, it was uh, effected in St. Vincent. Trinidad also had a prohibition law. Yes. And Trinidad, Grenada did not. Sorry, go ahead. And Grenada did not. Yes, Grenada too. Grenada also. Yes. Okay. Um, but take us through the repealing of yeah. those because I okay. think at present there's in Trinidad yeah. there is the yeah. okay. holiday and the... Now, the, the St. Vincent Act was the first, was mm -hmm. passed in 1912. Mm -hmm. Once that law was passed, Trinidad decided they were going after the Spiritual Baptist. Mm -hmm. And they copied the St. Vincent Act clause by clause, the only thing they changed was from 
shakers as they call them in St. Mm -hmm. Vincent to shouters as they call them in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the law was the same. Mm -hmm. Because if they did not do that, they may not have gotten it passed. Mm -hmm. When that law, that was in 1917, mm -hmm. when the law reached England, the chief players were now at the, the chief players mm -hmm. at the top of the pecking order in the colonial office were the same people who prohib recommended the prohibition of the act in 1912. Mm -hmm. Right. Then in 1927, the governor general decided to bring a bill to the legislature to prohibit the Spiritual Baptist in Grenada, 1927. Mm. So that's the spread. Mm. But immediately the law was passed. There was resistance, of course. Mm. There were petitions for prohibition. Uh, there were strategies that were employed other than that by calling themselves other things. For example, mm. you know, the, the um, Butler, Uriah Butler is well mm. known for building a church that he called the Moravian Baptist Church. Mm. Uh, there was never a name like that anywhere in, in the world, the Moravian Baptist Church. So they tried to avoid the name Shouters mm -hmm. as a strategy, and so the name Spiritual Baptist came into being. It, the Spiritual Baptist name was adopted in St. Vincent, but they also kept their original name, the Converted, mm -hmm. which is a name they still use. In Grenada, I don't know what the name was before they called themselves Shakers, but mm -hmm. um, they also adopted the name Spiritual Baptist. Mm -hmm. So that, that was part of the mm -hmm. strategy, but it was petitioned. And then in 1937, the first bill was introduced in the legislature by an independent an independent uh, legislator, McIntosh, mm -hmm. George McIntosh, calling for repeal. Mm -hmm. First reform, and then repeal. So mm -hmm. the repeal in the legislature started there. It was vetoed, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. you know, in, and uh, or there, was a, there were instructions to veto it. Mm -hmm. But then they lost one of their support that had gone on vacation, mm -hmm. right? He had gone on vacation, and the government replaced him with a, with a prohibitionist mm -hmm. legislator. So he realized that he could not get a majority vote, as he had gotten when he brought the motion before the legislature. Mm -hmm. So he just suspended that and engaged in newspaper uh, you know, advocacy mm -hmm. and so on. And where then he left the legislature. He lost the election in 1951. Mm -hmm. In Trinidad, same uh, sort of profile of petitions and, and so on, brought before the legislature. But then we had elections of 1946 under uh, universal adult suffrage, suffrage, and that changed the whole scenario. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the, the constituencies where some of the prominent players in the politics mm -hmm. were, were Baptist strongholds, spiritual okay. Baptist strongholds. Mm -hmm. In uh, Belmont, for example, mm -hmm where Albert Gomes was running, was a spiritual Baptist stronghold. In fact, Belmont is the only place named in the Prohibition Act. Mm. You know. Then in South Trinidad, also the same thing. So it, they, but there were few players in, at, at the time. They mm. did not constitute themselves into a majority in the legislature. Did, did Dr. Eric Williams have to contend with that as well? No, not yet. No, mm. he had nothing to do with prohibition. Mm. In 1950, the constitution was modified. Mm to allow for a majority of elected representatives. Yes. They, so that the election of 19, nine, late 1950 would have brought in a different profile of people. A lot of them trade unionists, mm -hmm. you know, working class people like a butler and so on. One of the first things they did was to bring a repeal bill before the legislature, which passed unanimously mm -hmm. in March 1951. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's Trinidad. Okay. A similar repeal bill was brought before the legislature in Jamaica, mm. in, sorry, in St. Vincent, but it, it passed the legislature, but the governor repealed, vetoed it. Mm -hmm. And not until 1965 did the, a bill come back again, Joshua under E.T. Joshua, mm -hmm. and uh, unanimous support. So Trinidad 1951 repeal, mm -hmm. St. Vincent 1965, Unfortunately, the Grenada Act is still on the books. So that's the story. Okay. So where I want to go now, um, we are now in an age where we're speaking about issues of reparations. 
So I will want to touch on this, um, but I want to take it from, from the perspective of this, the focus of this book, which is really the right of Africans to their form of spiritual expression, religious expression. What do you think is the significance of that? We have, we spoke about the, the Baptists. We also have Rastafari, which came later. You have even the issue of Obia and whatever people's conception of those things are. What do you think is the significance of having, for instance, works like yours, discussions like this, and, and, and generally the thrust to deal with the right of African people to their form of religious expression? What is the relevance, significance of that in this time as we are speaking about reparations, emancipation, etc.? Right. Well, I think we need to acknowledge, first of all, that reparations within CARICOM is now mm. framed within what might be a uh, manifesto on mm. what we call the 10-point plan. 10-point plan, yes. Which is to be modified to include some other aspects that are already agreed upon. But let's mm -hmm. deal with the yes. original 10-point plan. Mm. Within that 10-point plan, you have psychological rehabilitation. Mm. I think there is where a work like this would be relevant. Mm. Psychological rehabilitation speaks to the, re the, the urgency and the imperative mm -hmm. to repair the damage that was done to the African psyche, mm -hmm. the African spirit and spirituality and all of that through the various strategies deployed during slavery mm -hmm. and uh, post-slavery because after slavery, the colonization of the mind was intensified. Mm -hmm or rather I like to put it also in terms of the enslavement of the mind. So we move from taking the chains of the body and putting it around the mm -hmm. mind. So that today, the big challenge that we have, of course, is not physical slavery, although there are elements of that you find in what they call in new slavery and so on. Mm -hmm. But we are talking chattel slavery here, yeah. on the law, mm -hmm. the British law. Modern day slavery is not governed by law. Mm -hmm. So we move from chattel slavery, physical slavery, or slavery of the body, enslavement mm. of the body, in which you had elements of mental slavery. But after emancipation, the onslaught against the African mind, the mm. African spirit intensified. If mm. the education system was designed towards that objective, the, all of the missionary uh, religious bodies that came from overseas, mm -hmm. they came with one purpose, to control the African mind mm -hmm. and spirit. So that the resistance to that was, was um, multidimensional, mm -hmm. but one aspect was the, the, the creation of Africanized Christian religious okay. denominations. All right, I want you to elaborate on that in yes. a bit. We're going now for a break. This is okay. Nation Beat, but you spoke about education and all of those things, and it would require an expansion. Uh, we'll be right back. This is Nation Beat. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security, and Rural Development is placing heavy emphasis on the concept of food security. It's our prosperity, our future. There are business opportunities in fisheries and aquaculture. If you are involved in this sector or you are a member of the Fishers Cooperative, you are entitled to rebate on fuel consumed. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security and Rural Development also provides technical support and training as well as juvenile fish for aquaculture or aquaponic farmers. If you are interested in business opportunities in fisheries and aquaculture, you can contact the Chief Fisheries Officer at 468-4135 for further details. We are now back. This is Nation Beat and I'm here speaking with Dr. Claudius Fergus about his book Against Toleration and various issues surrounding slavery, uh, the religious persecution of the spiritual Baptists. And before the break, we were discussing the relevance of dealing with African forms of spirituality. And you spoke of um, psychological, mental slavery, you mentioned. So I'd like you, if you could elaborate on, on well, what you had begun speaking about. With regard, you spoke of the education system, you spoke about uh, religion. So if you could just tell us a little bit in terms of how you, the role these things play and the significance of dealing with those. Right. 
By the end of the 19th century, we had the emergence of what we call a black educated middle class. Mm -hmm. But that happened despite mm -hmm. the objective of education, not mm -hmm. because of it. Mm -hmm. In 1935, the British sent a consultant named John Sterling mm -hmm. to the Caribbean and to inquire and recommend what kind of ed primary education was suitable to the situation that was under apprenticeship at the time, so-called apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And he recommended that the education system to be established should be such to maintain control over the minds of the masses, mm -hmm. to ensure that the laboring, the, the access to the laboring classes by the planters remain constant. Okay, so that's an actual... That was the objective. That is in black and white. Mm -hmm. You know, if you read on the, the history of education in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you would see, mm -hmm. you must see those documents. We studied those documents at A-levels. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a special course called the West Indian History right. in the, before CXC took over, the Cape took over. And right. that, those documents, we studied those documents there. John mm -hmm. Sterling, mm -hmm. you know. So that was the nature of the education system. But the education system was mainly in the hands of the church. Mm -hmm. And there was an explosion of, of churches immediately that emancipation was decided upon. Mm -hmm. The idea was to ensure that the masses who were to be freed were, were not to be freed to enter into and their own sort of spiritual arrangement and religious arrangement, but mm -hmm. under the arrangement of the colonial masters. Okay. So you find that new religious organizations came, the old ones expanded, mm -hmm. you know, where you find there were difficulties in getting a priest and so on, there were churches all over the place and so mm -hmm. on. Religion, the religion and education went hand in hand mm -hmm. because most of the churches had their schools mm -hmm. and most of the schools were run by it. Churchmen. Mm. Right. As I said, the resistance against that included the formation of Africanized Christianity, which had started before, mm -hmm. as I indicated, since the 1770s, yeah. North America expanded across the Caribbean. But there were new Africanized Christian denominations established in the 19th century as a result of that. Mm -hmm. When in addition to that, uh, there was a new migration of Africans, Africans from the continent into the Caribbean. St. Lucia got some mm -hmm. of yes. them yeah. um, across the Caribbean. Not, I don't think any went to Barbados. I think to just about less than 100 went to Tobago. Mm -hmm. But Trinidad got a large number of them, about 9,000. Mm -hmm. Jamaica, um, Guyana got a large number. Jamaica got a large number. Mm -hmm. St. Vincent got about one, over 1,000. Those Africans brought their religion with them. Mm -hmm. So that the Orisha, what we call the Orisha religion, the Ifa divination practice yeah. of Trinidad is a result of the new migration yeah. after emancipation. It is not just a survival of what yeah. came during right, the slavery yes. period. We, have we had Kele in St. Lucia right. as well. Yeah. So across the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you had elements, variations of that. Congolese religious, mm -hmm. but the ones that survived in a major institutional way were the, the, the Yoruba mm -hmm. uh, religious system called Orisha Santeria, you yeah. know, whatever, Dandomble, in different places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But in addition to that, the Congolese religion somehow got uh, syncretized mm -hmm. with the African Baptist religion and created spiritual baptism. Mm -hmm. So in some measures, a lot of what we see in spiritual baptism is Congolese, uh, is Congolese. Mm -hmm. And the morning rite is one of them, okay. which has some influence from Yoruba land, but the predominant thing is Congo. Would you be able to tell, say a little bit about what that entails, the morning? The morning, one of the t challenges I had was mourning. I mm. started writing the book thinking that mourning was a rite of passage, sort of. In mm. other words, a one-off kind of thing. Yeah. When I completed the manuscript, I had to go and revise the whole thing. Because mm. people were telling me, one person said, you know, I, this is the fourth time I went on mourning. Mm. I, I, and people were telling me they mourn up to 20-something times. Mm. So it is not a rite of passage. Mm. You go on a morning is one of the most stringent forms of fasting and meditation and mm -hmm. prayers where you are deprived of 
a lot of things. So, but after morning, you, I'm using terms loosely, you yeah. graduate into a new rank mm -hmm. within the 22 ranks of the Spiritual Baptist Church. Okay. So it, that is the main reason, I think, besides, you know, a spiritual calling mm. to go and mourn, okay. that people go on what is called the mourning ground. On the morning ground, I don't want to say too much. This is one of the most yes. fundamental things, mm. but I'm saying what I got from my mom mm. and what other people said. Mm. But there is the reenactment of, of death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. They've put in a physical coffin, but not a wooden coffin. The coffin is drawn on the ground, mm -hmm. shape, and they, put, they have to lie there for hours at a mm. time. Their eyes are banded, so there's no light. There's absolutely no light mm. for the entirety of the morning period. Mm. And my interpretation of it, from a historical point of view, is that the whole of the slave ship, dark, mm -hmm. Williams call it like a coffin. You had enough space like a man in a coffin mm. in his capitalism and slavery. Mm. I myself have been in what is called a barracoon. Mm -hmm. Some people say a dungeon ac across yeah. the board, but barracoon, a house where the floor was about that from the ground. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what is there. There was a little trap door that they sent people in who are they now brought as captives. Mm -hmm. It was the height of the deck of a ship. Mm -hmm. You went down into that hole. They kept you there for a few days. You couldn't see a thing. I went down there. I went with some students from UWE. Mm -hmm. And the people were shocked. The students were shocked. I went down there. Fortunately, I had a camera. I was just taking pictures blindly because yeah. I had the night shutter on, so I got some nice visuals. Mm. But you could not see a thing. You could not see your hand. You could not see anything. Mm. They stayed there, and the idea was to condition them to the whole of the ship. Mm. Darkness, the dark darkness. Mm. Having survived the middle passage, it was like surviving death okay. and rebirth. I believe it has something to do with that. And that is why the water plays such a crucial role as well. Oshun, the, mm. the deity of the waters, mm. that you survive. You had to have living water. That living water thing mm. was the water they had also crossed. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, the, the idea of mourning was to prepare you for a new life. It was like rebirth, death and rebirth. Mm. Spirit, you know, evangelists talk about born again Christians. Yeah. This is the same kind of doctrine okay. from a Perhaps I, I don't want to say deeper. Let yeah, me not yeah. compare That's, anything. Yeah. Let me not. All let right. me. Um, yeah. Okay. Let I want to touch on a few things yeah. before we end. Um, again, we are still in this time of reparations and discussing other different changes. And I know recently in Trinidad, there is the move to change the make some changes to the coat of arms. Um, I would like you to as as thoroughly as possible, in as briefly as possible as well to speak on that, the significance of it, you know, um, yeah, of changing the coat of arms. Right. Well, sometime around 2019, the CARICOM, heads of government, mm. mandated the CARICOM Reparations Commission to try to persuade, you know, um, to engage in activism virtually, mm. uh, to change colonial monuments right. that celebrated, commemorated, um, colonial criminals, we call them, mm -hmm. uh, who committed crimes against humanity, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, place names that also celebrated these criminals, you know, and signage, because sometimes it's in signage. We yeah. had one of those, for example, at Lopino that glorified the slave master there, mm -hmm. Conk de Lopino, call him, mm. you know, a glorious slave master and so mm. on, a glorious so on. While they demean the, the, the people that he enslaved. Mm. In Labre, there's one sign there that celebrates Walter Raleigh as the discoverer mm. of the Pitch Lake. Mm. So there's signage, the monuments, and place names. Uh, the prime minister was the prime minister at the time. He mm. was a member of one, some of those subcommittees. Mm. And uh, the Minister of Education at the time, our minister, I think, was the chair of that subcommittee at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the cabinet discussion for quite some time. Mm -hmm. However, the, gov the government appointed a committee last year 
And the committee is called the Committee on Monument Signage and, 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 and Places and so on. And they mm -hmm. had um, uh, a lot of, of um, consultation mm -hmm. with community groups, individuals. I was among the first group that went for consultation, so I know what is mm -hmm. happening there. But in addition to that, I, will, I am still a member of the Freedom Project, Caribbean Freedom Project, mm -hmm. which was formerly called the Crossroads Freedom Project. Right, yes. And we had begun since 2015 advocating for the removal of these signages, the changing of offensive names, and particularly those that glorified uh, colonialism. Yeah. We succeeded in getting the university to change the name of Milner, Milner Hall, Hall yeah. after Alfred Milner, the architect of apartheid in South Africa. Mm. Um, we got the signpost that Lopino painted out. Mm. We supplied them with an alternative narrative for that. And the biggest, the biggest target was Columbus. Mm -hmm. But we had been advocating for Columbus alongside the Wawa people in particular. The Wawa mm. is one of the native groups in yes. Trinidad. We had been advocating, we submitted petition to the parliament. Mm -hmm. So this was also part of the response to the petition mm -hmm. because the, 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 the prime minister had announced uh, as a response to the petition which was read out in parliament that he would set up a national, set up national consultation. Mm -hmm. Well, he did that through the committee that he set up. Mm -hmm. So the removal of, the, of, the, um, of that, the symbol of the three ships wasn't a shock to us. Mm -hmm. The surprise was that he did it before the committee reported. As far as okay. I'm aware, they're holding consultation, public consultation. The other one was in private, but mm -hmm. they're holding a public one on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they submitted a preliminary report, mm -hmm. but it is in alignment with that committee. Okay. The, the part of the emblem that he removed was the three ships of mm -hmm. Columbus that had nothing to do with Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing to do with Trinidad, but indirectly, yeah. those ships never passed near Trinidad or anything. Yeah. They may not even have been in existence at the time. Mm -hmm. But the three ships indirectly impact on Trinidad, mm -hmm. in that the three ships represent the arrival in the Caribbean of invaders who unleashed genocide on the people, enslavement, mm. human trafficking, and so on. So it is not something that should have been on the coat of arms on the, in the first place. Okay. In the first place. But there are other things that we are calling for to be removed from the coat of arms. Now, it was replaced by the steel pan. Yeah. But there's a helm or something looking like a crown at the top, which mm. represents the queen. In fact, in, when it was drawn, it was said to represent the queen, Queen mm. Elizabeth at the time. Right? You are a republic now. <laughs> we should be a republic right. now. Yeah. Then there is the shield, mm -hmm. right? There is also a knight's helmet yes. under the crown. I think we have one. On Knighthood our represents European imperialism mm. and expansionism. Mm. There's the shield which also represents European warfare, mm. warfare against our people, mm. right? So that there are a lot of colonialist imperialist symbols on the heraldry of of of, of the uh, of the thing by the way mm. saint lucia also has some of those yes huh? we do saint yeah. lucia mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. have some of those so perhaps yeah. you know it might be a good time to re-examine your own coat of arms as well mm. so it has been changed but we are calling when i say we the activists like the crossroads freedom project mm. we also discussed that at our reparations committee meeting mm. last week and we the, the consensus was that the best thing to do is to revamp the crest, create a new crest. There are some mm. relevant symbols there. Mm. For example, the hummingbirds, the coquico, and so on. But mm. even the tree hills represent a Colombian symbol. Mm. Those tree hills are myths. Mm. They're mythical. Those tree hills, nobody knows where they are. Mm. The tree hills represent the conceptualization of the discovery by Columbus, so-called discovery, coming to Trinidad, mm. why he wanted to call it the La Trinity. Mm. But that is a myth, so that has to go as well. Something else should replace it. Okay. Um, we have very little time left, but um, I know you're also the chair of the Reparations Committee um, in Trinidad. We have, we have, there's a number of issues I wish I could have touched on with you with regard to even the issue that keeps rearing its head, no pun intended, with having to do with grooming and this sort of thing. 
But given our time limit, um, we know that we are approaching the end of the first decade for people of African descent, and they are looking towards another decade. So I would like if you could share um, some remarks about the significance of that and the relevance of even pursuing another decade. Right, well, in Trinidad, I guess in a number of other places, mm. much was not accomplished in the first decade, which mm. ends this month, I understand, mm. or at least at the convening of the next General Assembly. I'm yeah. not sure whether it is now or even at the end of this year, I'm not mm. sure. Yeah. But it ends this year. Mm -hmm. Right, now for most of the decade, the National Reparations Committee in Trinidad was really sidelined by the government. Mm -hmm. I can't bad talk my own government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was sidelined by the government. Yeah. I was on that committee, so I'm telling you from mm -hmm. personal experience. We continued to function, but the government really did not pay attention to us. Mm -hmm. We continued to function because we had been instituted by the previous regime mm -hmm. in 2014. The new government came in in 2015 and did not recognize, officially recognize, mm -hmm. the committee. They did not disband it. Mm -hmm. We offered to resign if necessary to reconstitute the committee, mm -hmm. and we got no answer to that. So we mm -hmm. continued meeting regularly mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, um, cooperating and collaborating with the CRC and so on. So the committee continued until 2021. Mm -hmm. And then, when a new chair was announced, we stopped meeting. Mm -hmm. A new chair was announced, but no committee was established until last year. Mm -hmm. So for most of the decade, there was no reparations commission. So that the, I think the ESC, the Emancipation Support Committee, took on the, the responsibility mm -hmm. to advocate for something to be done. I know mm -hmm. they kept haranguing the government consistently. Mm -hmm. But there was no response that we can say definitively that this was a response to the decade in okay. Trinidad. So we are hoping that the call for a second decade succeeds. Um, one of the deficiencies, I think, in the first decade was that there was no f forum, no platform, no sort of committee in place, action mm -hmm. committee to be able to mobilize some kind of common effort to mm -hmm. extract the maximum from the, from, from the objectives of the, of the decade. Mm -hmm. But there's that in place now, mm -hmm. you know, the Permanent Forum, again, under the U auspices of the UN, mm -hmm. and uh, led by Dr. June Sumo, mm -hmm. your yes. um, ambassador. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. your, 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 uh, well, she's also a member of the Reparations Committee. Here. She's a member yes. of the Reparations Committee, but in that capacity, mm -hmm. and she's a very dynamic, very, very dynamic leader. Mm -hmm. We expect that if the UN should uh, um, acknowledge and, mm -hmm. and, and, and declare mm -hmm. a second decade, the First Peoples had two, ten decades, yeah. so it's not like setting a precedent, yeah. that this time around we would be able to marshal our forces together from mm -hmm. the very beginning and ensure that, you know, action is taken. Okay. All right. Um, if you could just... Just briefly, we have about 30 seconds left. Um, some of the, a few things, if you could point out a few things that you would like to see come out of such a decade that well, can be dealt with. Okay, for one thing, the reparations um, agenda. Yes. This is at the, the top, mm. right? In that if we can mobilize and, 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 uh, and, and get all the forces together to recognize that the, the there is an imperative for reparations mm -hmm. for people not only of African descent in the diaspora, mm -hmm. but for Africans on the continent as well, mm -hmm. which, of course, you know, was a victim of colonization Definitely, as well. Yes, so yes. I think because of being chairman of Reparations Commission and the importance mm -hmm. of reparations to the region, I would say that that should be one of the things that okay. would be actualized right. in as many of the points in the 10-point plan as possible. as possible. Okay, so I want to... Um, thank Dr. Claudius Fugas. Um, we've been discussing his book, Against Toleration, which deals with the persecution and prohibition of the spiritual Baptists, um, as well as a number of wider ranging issues to do with reparations, to do with people of African descent in the Caribbean. Um, and yes, so the book, Against Toleration, 
Claudia, Dr. Claudius Fogas is a former retired senior lecturer of UWE. And I want to thank you for being here with us. And I'm hoping that in the future we can have another discussion to discuss even wider issues in relation to the topics that were covered. Thanks again. This is Nation Beat on NTN. The panel, the discussion, an objective and impartial view of the issues of interest to you. Nation Beat is on now.